there has been some questions about how to properly set up this uh, blog software that I had um, you working on. So that's what we're going to take a look at today. Um, in our um, what I wanted you to do was to download the blog software from the Learn Shell. It might be in this week's, it might be in next week's. And I also want you to connect to your Debian server. You should have a directory called blog in the document root and inside that directory I want you to upload the sample code um, that you got from that blog zip. Now that should look very familiar to you. That is the same blog software that you've seen with um, uh, web dev uh, 2 and or 3 the blog software the stung eye blog software from Kyle okay when you take a look at this thing there's a couple of specific files we want to talk about here one is the config file you should have be at this time you should now have configured your um, FTP transfer software to use your preferred text editor okay you can change this email to a correct email, but to be honest, we really don't play with that feature. It requires setting up other features in the environment, and it's out of scope for this class. So you can play with that and add a mailer to your environment if you are interested. There are PHP-based mailers that can use things such as Gmail accounts. They're very tricky to get up and working, though, with the new security features that Gmail has put in place, but they do exist. We have a couple of credentials in our setup that we really do need to take a look at. The username is the user that we set up before. Now we probably set up two users, blog admin and blog user. This is the local host connection that we are focusing on, so we want to use the blog user username. And we also want to use the password. Now I have the ones that I set up in my script. Your credentials may be different. You have to match the credentials you specified before okay and then you have to specify the database as blog okay now when we connect to our database software when we use SQL manager we connect remotely using an IP address but you must understand your environment this remote connection allows us to use the blog admin account that we created to do remote administration of this information of this database this is a local host because it's going to be a script running on the same machine as the database is running. If this was a different environment and we had two separate machines, virtual or real or whatever, if they had separate IP addresses, we would have to go through that configuration, we would have to specify the IP address, and we would have to ensure that the user we define here is allowed to do remote connections, as we saw with the privileges in our last class. Once we have those things set up, we can save that information and we can close it down. You should see that the file has been transferred in your FTP client and that is perfect. There is another file here and that is called posts.sql. This script is a sample post, of course, I'm sorry, three sample posts. And this allows us to create a table and populate it with some sample data. It creates a table, calls it posts, and puts three records in it. We could try running that remotely, but because we've got our SQL manager in place, we can simply select it, ensure that that is the only database active. The MyDB database or any other ones are not select. We open up our SQL editor. There it is. And then we can paste our code. Okay, again, ensuring we have the correct database selected. Blog on the appropriate IP. We can then execute that code. Okay, when we refresh our tables, we see that we have a table for posts. And inside that, we've got um, three records. Okay. We do not need to save this work. This was simply an SQL script that allowed us to populate our database. So now, in theory, we can test our connection. Where am I? Okay. 
And, I mean, I'm zoomed in a little bit. I don't need to be zoomed in that much. The fact that the home page loads with um, information in it shows us that we have probably configured our database and deployed our application properly. Is anybody not at this point? Please be honest. All good? All right. Click on new post. Give it a test. Click on create. And we see that we now have four posts in our blog. Let's talk about why I'm having you use a database front end and not just have everything done through SQL statements. This is a delicate balance between an example of a production environment and an example of a development environment. One of the things of a development environment is that you create a bunch of dumb data and you want to get rid of it. This front end allows you to do that. Select record 5 right click sorry select record 5 there is a delete button somewhere hit the delete key select yes refresh your data the record is gone refresh your web page the record is gone okay so this is the big reason Database management is very important when you're developing and sometimes when you're deploying an application I wanted you to see what I prefer to use because I don't have a chance to teach you guys in the introductory courses very much anymore. Any questions on that? Does that make sense? All right. Thank you. Feedback is good and appreciated. Okay. Next thing I want to talk about is setting up the login script. Okay. When we take a look at the code in this example, we have a table called members and we can simply use that. And if you see, I'm using the database blog. If you take a look at the code here, the database name is blog, the username is blog user, and the password is password and it matches the credentials that we defined when we created these items. Now that you have this in place, you should be able to start adding this functionality. Was everybody able to add this functionality? Was everybody able to get all the files in this done properly? Yes or no? Please give me feedback. No? Anybody else? All right, that's, thank you. Thank you, that's exactly, thank you very much for the feedback, that's exactly what I was looking for. Thank you very much. Okay, so you can go and type all these things in or you can go and copy and paste all of these things. As with most things in the world, it's often going to be a balance of the two, okay? There's no um, easy way from an academic delivery point of view to cover this and cover all the points that I want to cover. So I've done it in this manner. I created a database. I created a table of users. I store the information in plain text. You never want to do that, but that's okay. We fix it at the end, okay? We get our stuff working, and then we add encryption at the end. Should you do it that way? I don't know. What I do know is that if you do it this way and you create unencrypted storage, you want to enable encrypted storage as quickly as possible. The longer you wait, the more records you have to transition. Ideally, you do encryption as you create your system. Ideally, that's the way you want to go forward and do this. Okay? Best way? I don't know. From an academic point of view, this is how I chose to deliver it. Okay? Also, in Learn, if you take a look at the content, There's a PHP and login file. I think that has it. When you take a look at this file,
these are the eight or nine files that I want you to use for this activity. Okay? They are all going to be part of the blog environment and we're going to all use these. Now you can add these to a separate directory structure, but again, we are going to add this to our blog software. So we can get it working here and then you can modify it and add it to the environment. Okay? Let's um, when you take a look at the structure of these documents, there isn't a lot of HTML stuff around them. When you take a look at them, they're all also PHP files. I kind of did that on purpose because the entirety of the Stung Eye application is PHP. The early examples when I was showing you how to do um, an SQL injection, that used HTML and PHP to clearly delineate between the two. This example that I've given you here just uses PHP even for the static pages. How you want to handle that is entirely up to you. Once you have this working, however, I want you to incorporate these files into this blog software, including adding something to the top. I'm just going to show you what I mean but what that means in the long run is that you have the menu.php directory. For each one of these, I want you to have an each functionality. Like you, for example, login, login, login. And as we go forward and as we add uh, degrees of protection to our website, we're going to modify this based on different activities. But that's okay for now don't worry about it okay so you add new menu items because you've seen this all before this is nothing new so that when you click on the reload page it'll take you to different functionality now obviously that hasn't been made so we have to ensure that these pages exist okay how do we make that happen that's not it that's it so I want you to add these files I want you to add these files to your website and then we can modify them going forward okay and they are based again on this document the first thing we're going to do is create our table called members this is also found in the setup.sql statement. Okay. Here is our create table members and an insert a record. And we've also got the database connection information. Um, these credentials obviously aren't necessarily going to be the ones that we use, but this was an extension of what I was talking about at the end of last week, where we um, create different SQL accounts for different functionality. We're not going to do that, but that's what this extra code is here. But I'm going to go back, create my table members, and populate it with a record. Okay. Again, I've only got the one table, so let me go back to my SQL editor, create my tables members, and populate it with a single record. Run my query. I now have two tables. I have one table for members. And when I look at the data, it has a single record. And don't, you know what, you can crack, collapse the username. Don't collapse the password column too much yet because it's going to be a lot more data in there very soon. Okay? So, refresher. I have a database called blog. In my database called blog, I have two tables, one for the posts, one for the members. Could I have called my table users? Of course I could have. There is some value in security through obscurity. How obscure is the term members? A little more secure and a little more obscure, I should say, than users. If I really wanted to be obscure in the name of my tables, I would have called it something like coffee cup or something ludicrous like that, okay? Or just key mashing. 
doesn't matter. There's value in doing security through obscurity as long as you don't rely on it exclusively. All right, any questions? Okay, I have my table created. I also have my code in place. Okay, so let's first take a look at the um, the first file that was called login. Main login, that's what it's called. Let's take a look at my main login page. Okay, it takes a username, it takes a password, and they are required, and it has a submit. There is a form called check login. So again, I have delineated the information. I have a check login script. We'll actually go in and query the database. All right. Please note, I'm using PDO. I am doing the prepare statement. Um, actually, I don't have a I don't have a very good login here. Okay. What's wrong with this login script? Anybody? It's not binding the parameters, yes. Okay. If we take a look at check-in final, this is a better example of what I hope you will do with your login script. So the login, the check login is supposed to be a midpoint in the process. And when we take a look at it, we can actually see in the check login script it does exactly what I told you I don't want you to do. It doesn't bind the parameters and more importantly it pulls the username and password from the database. And I want you to avoid this at all costs and I will be checking this when you do your um, competency on this activity. What I'm going to want to see is something like this. First off, I don't know who said it, where you bind the parameters, okay? Second of all, you pull the password. I'm missing the bind parameter here. You pull the password from the table that matches the username. You don't need the and password. What's wrong with this code? This code is not right. You don't need the username and the password, but the thing is, is that you want to pull the password and then you want to compare the passwords. And that's what I'm trying to say in this document. I guess you can pull both the username and the password. I don't know what I was doing with that, but we'll ignore it for now. The important thing is that once you retrieve the password based on the username value from the database, this is not going to work because the password is a hash. So obviously it's not going to work. Okay you compare password strings after you run through and encrypt it based on the encryption that we have here. And this is the better example that I want you to see. All right. And this is what I want to really focus on right now. So I hope everybody can understand this part right here. In the code that I gave you, there is a check login encrypted script. I want you to take a look at that, please. We're going to talk about encryption later this week. We've talked about this before, but what we need to do is set up an encryption process to ensure that should the passwords become compromised somehow, they cannot be used to log in. You still need to know what the person's password is if you're going to allow them to log in. Okay? Just getting that password string from the database is not sufficient. Also, the password as it is stored should not be decryptable. It is a one way or what we call a hashing of the string. When we encrypt it, there is no algorithm that allows us to decrypt that string. All we can do is re-encrypt it with the exact same process. So we're going to take a look at the registration in a minute. To that end, we need to modify our database. Okay, 
we need to modif modify it so not only is it storing a password but it is also storing a salt a field called salt and that's what I say in this document here okay for this to work you have to create a new um, column called salt all right and that's what I talk about here we have uh, three columns in our table ID username password and we're going to add a fourth column to our table that will store that salted information I'm on page 12 of the handout so for this to work we need to go back into our table our table is called members we have it open here we select fields and then we can go right click and add a new field I don't know if you can see that well but when you have your table members open there's a data tab there's a bunch of other tab but we're interested in the fields tab the second from the left right click add a field we're going to call that salt it is a text field or a you could type in varchar too but I think the instructions said just use a text field and there's no real limit there did I say text field in the notes oh varchar 200 okay we'll do we'll follow the instructions varchar 200 for my SQL it's probably better just to use the text field it seems to work well but at the end of the day you want to be able to store a lot of characters okay you can do insert last and um, once you've done that you may want to make it um, specifically that it is not nullable but if you do that now you create problems I would suggest you do that after you have everything else done you ensure that every time a record is created it has a password and it has a salt we're not going to do that right now it'll add it at the end of our list of columns and when we say execute the code it will populate it with a new column okay everybody get that some of the emails yep some of the emails I have gotten are probably going to be addressed by this but I'm going to address it in another way as well okay once you do that you should be able to go through each and every one of these scripts and get them to work one after another oh, where are we sorry one after another following these instructions it is very important that you do that once you have added encryption to your website you need to be able to store the information in an encrypted manner and that's where the registration page comes in and if you take a look at your code there is a process register script which will actually go through and store information about the rec about the user a username password and salt and it's going to store my username encrypted password and salt and how does it get salt it generates it through a PHP variable called unique ID this will generate a unique ID which means that every time somebody registers they're going to get a unique salt the salt is stored unencrypted that is fine in our conversation when we were talking about rainbow tables when we were talking about cracking passwords I said one of the ways to ensure that um, it was harder to crack was to use salts I don't know if I went into this in sufficient detail at the time but it's imperative if you're going to use salts that every user has a different salt the reason being is that it's a lot harder to create what are called rainbow tables if everybody has a unique salt and that was one of the failings of earlier versions of the Microsoft security access managers on the client machines up until I think it was Windows 8 maybe Windows 8 could do it as well apparently you can do it in Windows 10 again I haven't played with it since I've discovered this but up to Windows 7 the security access manager and the Windows client side all used the same encryption algorithm and they didn't make them unique so that means if I had a password on one Windows machine and a password on another's Windows machine those two were similar enough that it was very easy for me to crack them using things like off crack 
and they only had one simple rainbow table to work with and that was it um, the character diversity of course made it a lot harder because the more characters you have the bigger the rainbow tables are but if you recall from our conversation on rainbow tables the two ra the rainbow table is basically a dictionary file of pre-existing hashes the thing is is that if everybody has a unique salt you need a unique rainbow table for each user okay if I have 10 users in my members table 10 unique salts and I want to crack those passwords using rainbow tables I am going to need to generate 10 separate rainbow tables each with a salt which of course is way too much work for trying to figure out one password okay which is why when you start using um, hashes with salts it's better just to run through the process one at a time go through the encryption process using the salt and try and figure out what the string is and that's what we do we go through create a hash function we specify a parameter and we take the salt and the password together and then we we concatenate the two strings and we run that concatenated string through a hash algorithm so this is my hashing process right here. There we go. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. All right. So I grab a unique ID. That becomes my salt. And then I store that, store that as my salt. I do a string concatenations of whatever password the user supplied when they registered. I concatenate those strings and then I run it through the 512, SHA-512 type hash function in PHP. I then store the username, that hashed password, and the salt. Okay, I store the username, the encrypted password value that I figured out here, and the unencrypted salt. But this is the important thing. I take the user's password, I salt it, and then I run it through the same hash. When I want to check the login, I take the user's password, I pull the salt, work, salt from the database, and I recreate the process. I grab the salt, I grab the user's supplied password and I run it through the exact same hashing process. And then I compare the two results and ensure that the password isn't null. This can actually throw an error or this can actually break your login if you don't have that part as well. So I compare the password hashes. Whatever was stored, sorry, whatever was stored in the table versus whatever was run through the exact same algorithm compare those strings if they match start a session for that user otherwise hey your password is wrong try again okay I've also thrown extra strings to help you understand what you're doing okay when it comes time to do the competency I do not want to see those results does that help clear up some of the confusions around this work yes or no yeah okay for the next hour and a half I would like those of you who couldn't get it working to try working on it please if it's still not working we'll do one-on-one -on -one, um, shared sessions I'll probably ask you to share your desktop with me so I can take a look at it for the rest of you once you have this working incorporate it into the stung eye environment and when I say incorporate it I don't mean this uh, let's see if I can recreate this a little bit better. I think I called it login, didn't I? So let's call um, main login form. Is that what I called it? Main login. So let's let's re let's try and show you what I'm trying to talk about here. So now when I click on that, it loads the login page and it loads it fine. That is not acceptable. Okay. 
I want it to sit inside of this structure. So what I need to do is I need to take that login page and make sure it looks the same as, let's say, index. Where is it? Let's take a look at index.php. When I take a look at the index.php, there is a bunch of extra stuff that goes around it, and I want to see that. Okay. When I put that around my login page, it looks well, you know, something like that. Okay. Be aware. Okay, that works on the static HTML pages, for lack of better terms, all right? If you click on the process login, it has its own connection information. Also, Stungi blog has its connection information, so the two are going to conflict. You have to merge the two together, okay? This works fine, and it sits inside of the Stungi environment. Now, does that look good? I don't think that looks very good, so I would probably try and clean it up a little bit better. All right. Get a rid of the align. That looks a little bit better. Get rid of the background color. That was the border color. That's the background color. That looks a lot better to me. So what was that? 10 quick edits? That looks like it belongs, whereas that does, oops, sorry, one more. That does not belong in the application, all right? The application looks like this. your login page should match it. And you really uh, want to do this properly because I'm pretty sure I made a competency on this. Wait one, please. I'm just going to move that over here. Yeah, I made a Part of the setup is ensuring that the uh, Stungi is set up properly, the secure login for Stungi, and um, I want to make sure that your website looks. What the hell happened to it now? That's not it. Too many browsers open. Please don't look at my stuff that's popping up here periodically. There it is. Okay. I want your product to look like this. I do not want to look like two or three different styles hammered together so you can get a competency. All right. Any questions? I know I took an extra 10 minutes. I apologize. So this is your task. Add the functionality identified in this page to the blog software. My recommendation for you, if you've been following along, is to make sure that each of these pages work properly, make sure that the linkage works, and that you can add them to the Stungi blog application. My recommendation as well is not to use separate files. You are going to find it a lot easier if on the login page you do not call process login or check login. My recommendation is you call yourself. All right. Call the login page again and incorporate the check login encrypted code into a second block, if you will. If they supply credentials, process the login. Else, you know, give them the login form. I would recommend you do that. I am not going to make it. If you find it easier 
to have two separate scripts, go ahead. But as I understand it, you've been encouraged to have silos of functionality in your code a little bit. I'm not talking about, you know, um, everything in every file uniquely. But I, I'm pretty sure you've been taught to the login functionality can be, hey, are they logging in? Then check it. Else, give them the form to log in. I'd like to see something like that. I'm not going to make that a requirement of this code. Are there any questions? Okay, if I'm busy talking with somebody else and you want to chat, add your name to the queue. Um, if you've got this all done, if you're happy with how your website looks, it looks great, the login and everything, perfect. Keep in mind, I want the menus to work properly. So for example, I click on login and it tells me I'm on the home page, which means I have to go in to my code on the login page and I have to change it from index to login because that's what I called it on my menu page. I said the page is called login and it's loading the login page so this is my login page I need to call it login so that now when I shift reload I've clicked on login and it shows me that I'm on the login page. Okay, I will be checking that. I want your menus right I want it to, again, I want this to look like you're building a proper application. Any questions? Okay, try working through that. If you have any questions on getting your Stungi login page working, let me know. If you are 100% happy with your blog login page, we can do competencies. If there's other competencies you want to do, we can do those as well. Please understand that the focus, however, is answering questions. If somebody has a question, that takes priority over doing competencies. If nobody has questions, I'm happy to do competencies. And I'm going to stop recording now.